going to do an introduction to Git today. It kind of depending on the audience, we can you know make it a little more advanced if we want. Who here has actually used Git relatively? Almost everyone. Rachel, raise your hand. There you go. Okay, we'll kind of see where this goes. Um, so what is Git, just at a basic level? We use it to track changes in files, versions specifically. Um, it's considered a version control system, and it's designed for source code management. So we don't have to like duplicate file names that have different working paths. We can use the same file and reference different versions of that. So Git is actually distributed, which is actually unlike most other version control systems like SVN. <laughs> Um, different users maintain their own repositories locally instead of sharing one central repository. You may have noticed with like SVN or something, you've got your local repository and then the remote one. But there's really no like sense of having your own repository because it's all centralized. So Git tracks changes, not versions, where like SVN will track versions of files. You'll notice if you look at the hidden files in SVN, you're going to have like a little hidden file in every single directory where Git kind of centralizes that so you can track the changes instead of versions of files and with Git you don't have one single master repository you do have a master branch but that isn't that's just what we call that main branch we'll get into that later each repo may have its own change sets so when you do a commit that's considered a change set the benefits that Git provides over like SVN is you don't need constant network access to do a commit. You may notice on SVN if you commit, you have to push to that remote repository. Git allows you to have a local repository that's just yours, allowing you to have it more distributed so there's no single failure point. Failure point, And it encourages forking. You may notice on the GitHub, people advertise you can fork. It's because you can pull the repo down to your own machine and make changes to it as you like without interfering with anything they have going on. So this would be an example of what SVN uses, a two-tree architecture where we have a repository and then our working branch which is just on our local machine. We check out from the repository and then we can commit <laughs> back to the repo. Hey Matt. Get Ross. Yeah, he's behind it. So Git uses the three tree architecture where we have a repository we can check out from into our working repository on our local machine. And then you may notice if you use Git that you have to add, and that's what's called a staging index. We add things there, and then we commit, and then it goes back up to the repo again. So we have this constant cycle going where we stage things, commit them to the repo, and then we just have our working files. So at this point, it's kind of like up to you guys. I kind of felt like a lot of people don't know how Git actually works. We can go over a lot of different things. Um, we can go over uh, just basics if you guys want. We can go over how to undo changes, how to ignore files, branching, merging. What do you guys really want to learn? What don't you know? Find it. Well, when you have conflicts and you're trying to merge. When you have conflicts and you're trying to merge. Okay, we can talk about merging. The other thing is, yeah, the command line. Can you can we go over that versus a GUI? And what's what's better to use, command line? Um, I would say definitely command line is like the only way to go when working in Git, uh, except for really what Landon brought up, resolving conflicts. It can be really nice to have a tool to do merging for you, but everything else is pretty simple. Um, are you are you familiar with git commands? Should we go over that? Okay, we got some beginners. Let's go over some of those then. I use, I use source tree for the okay. GUI version. So you don't use command line. Okay. So do you have command line installed on your machine? I like git bash. Git bash? Okay, there you go. That's all you need. Um, so if you want to open up git bash, if you've got it, follow along, you can. Basically, what we're going to be looking at is how to, like, we'll just talk about how to initialize a repository, what that actually does on your system, and how those files are actually being tracked. So, uh, 
Okay. So how do you initialize a git repository? If you have git installed, you can just type git init. And that initializes an empty repository in that directory. Some of you might not be really aware of what happens, because if you look in that directory in like a file manager, you're not going to see anything. That's because the files are hidden. There's actually a hidden, hidden directory in that folder when you initialize a repository <coughs> called .git. And that's really where everything that's Git doing resides. If you remove that folder, you cease to have a Git repository. So like we can say Git status now, and it, we get some stuff back. But if we remove that, there's no longer a Git repository there. So if you ever like are working with a directory and you're trying to remove that repository somehow, it's because the folder's hidden, and it's also read and write protected from the user's perspective. So if you're on like Linux or Windows, you're going to need some kind of administrative privileges to do so. But we can do that. So what actually resides in that, that folder is a good question. So as you can see, we've got a bunch of stuff in here, like branches. And we have got a concept of a head. Now, if you're familiar with linked lists, there's a lot of ways that Git works like a linked list. You have these change sets constantly being committed, and that head is kind of the root of your, your tree. And it's constantly, that head is being moved and put on top of the stack each time you make a change. So if we actually were to look at that head and what's in that file, it's just referencing the master branch, because that's what we have by default, a branch called master. So if we then look at that, like what is in this file? Oh, there isn't one yet. Or did I do that wrong? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, let's add something. Maybe it's, it's been added. So let's make a file. As the get status command, we can see that there is a new file there in our working set, we're going to add that to this, we're going to stage that by add, and then we're going to commit, and we're going to add a comment, is everyone familiar with this so far? Yeah? How do you uh, delete the .git, because I actually just am set my virtual directory and now I've got everything ready to commit. You 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 want to delete the .git folder? Yeah. Uh, you're running Windows. Uh -huh. Are you in Git Bash? You might be able to remove it in there. Okay. Through a sudo rm dash r. So if you're not familiar with Unix commands, rm is to remove dash r is for recursive, which you have to use on directories. Command not found. Use, use the rm. Oh. But sudo is not found. Oh. So try just, just rm. Try rm dash r. No. Did that work? Yeah. No, cool. Okay. Just have to just like MD, like make directory, like make a folder. Mcdir. Yeah. So we've got this new file. We should now have actually something here. Okay. Yeah. So now we've initialized this master branch. We see this really big hash done here. This is a SHA one hash. I think it's forty characters long. And there's a uniquely generated hash generated with every commit. And that's really your way to reference getting back to that commit if you ever need to. So we notice that this is what is referenced in the head. And we'll notice if we add another commit, that'll actually change because we're moving our reference to the root of that tree with each commit. So that is kind of a look at what goes on there. If we were to make a new branch, We could then look in here. <clears throat> and you'll actually get a head for each branch. Has anyone worked with branches here before? No, not so much. Jeff's shaking his head yes. OK. You have a question? Oh, OK. Earlier, it asked for a password. How do you set a password? 
That was just my like root administrator password for my computer because okay. I was using sudo. Um, adding a password to Git, I'm not really sure if there's there is a way to do that or not. I've never tried to. Um, obviously, if you're using like GitHub or something, you have to use those credentials to do any pushes or pulls. But that's really up to the user. Um, are you guys familiar with git log? So, since we've made a commit, we only made one, we have this log here. And it will actually display all of the commits on a branch if you, if you want it to. So, it'll add this little hash here, which is your reference. And then there's the memo, the date, and the user that set it up. Um, if there's actually a lot of things you can do with GitLog when you're working in bigger projects. You can actually like kind of structure queries um, like log size, start and end dates, so that's pretty big. But if you wanted to, you could say git log dash n1 and that would return only the most recent response dot n is the dash n is the number of responses you want you can also say um, I think since and that'll only like that example would only show commits since January 1st of this year and you can kind of actually stagger these you could say until and you could say uh, 2014-01-01-02 and then we didn't get any responses because we haven't made any commits between the 20th of January and the 1st. So you can really do a lot of querying there. A lot of GUIs kind of have a lot of features for that but you can also do those in the command line through the command line utilities which is really useful. Um, one thing I think that we get to go over is like how to undo changes when you mess something up. So since we have this idea of our local files, our staged files, and our actual repository, depending on where files are at, you might have to maybe unstage a file or remove something from a repository, or maybe just you have a local file changed but you want what you had in the repository back. And there's really a different way to do each of those things. Um, so say we have this new file and let's add some text to it. This is just some fancy command line stuff. You don't need to worry about this. So now if we look in that file, we have a line that says Gibson is lame in it. But maybe Oh no, that's not what we wanted. We actually wanted what was back on our repository, but we've made, we've modified that file. So it actually gives you a nice little hint right here. If you want to discard the changes in the working directory, you can say git checkout dash dash in the file. And you could actually do this without the dash dash, but it is important for one reason. Git checkout is used not only for files, but for checking out branches. So if you didn't specify the dash dash, it's first going to look for a branch to check out and then look for a file to check out. So it's always safer to use the dash dash because that's saying I want a file, not a branch. So I would recommend doing that. But if we check out new file and then look back in that new file and Gibson is lame is now gone. But let's say that we staged this and we didn't mean to. So that means we added it to the the uh, working the stage. So now we've actually modified and staged that <coughs> file for a commit, but we've decided we don't actually want to do that. And it gives you another hint here in the command line as well. You can get reset head and the file name to on the stage. So that's pretty simple as well. So it unstaged it and now if we look in the file again it's still there but it hasn't been staged. So what you would do if you if you stage something you didn't want you would unstage it and then reset that 
to the checkout. Yeah. Uh, so adding and staging are very similar. What are the differences? Okay. So there are some there are some differences between uh, state. Like you mean your working directory and the stage? Yeah. Okay. And so the work. Okay, so your working directory, that's like your local files that are just right there on your hard drive. It's not anything inside of version control right now. And then when you add it, you're actually staging them. So when you commit, those are being added to the repository. The benefit of having the state, like the stage, so we've got like this layer here. So the benefit is, is that say we've made some changes that we want to keep, but some changes we don't want to. We can stage the files we want to keep and then reset everything in our working directory back to head. So then it goes back to the repository and pulls those files down from the repo. And then we have the staged files still and we can commit those up. So maybe you make a bunch of changes, you decide you only really want three of them you stage those changes, you reset the head, and then you can commit those changes you want while still keeping the old changes there. So it's kind of like this intermediary section where you can just add or remove things. So what, what does the call to add do differently than the call to stage? Is this um, adding is staging. Okay. This is where you add, <coughs> and this is where you commit. Because I've used both commands, and I've never really seen the difference between the two. You get get add or get stage. I didn't know there was a stage. There is a stage. Oh, OK. It, maybe you want to get add. So it, maybe it's a deprecated okay. uh, modifier, because there are a couple of those in git. Okay. So I guess this also works as stage because that makes sense. So they're exactly the That's same. That's a synonym. They're the same. Cool. So that's really what the point of that is. And then, of course, you can also have the remote up here. And then these go back and forth. OK, so. We looked at checking out a file, unstaging a file. An interesting thing you can also do is, for any reason, maybe you make a commit and you forget to do something. You don't really want to commit on top of that. You can actually amend the previous commit. So we, we have a commit here, right? We could add another commit on top of that, but maybe we want to just amend that commit, or maybe we want to change the comment on that commit. So if we add, we just edit new file, and we can say so we edited that file, gets like, okay, it's been modified. Do we want to like stage that? It's still down here in the working copy. We could stage it, add it to a new commit, or we could amend the previous commit. So if we just add that, we stage it like normal. But instead we say amend. And here we don't actually have to add a memo because we can just go off. Is that how you spell amend? No. We could just amend it and keep the same comment, or this is also the way you could change a comment. So if we add dash m, and then we go get log. We notice there's still only one commit there, but the comment changed and it's been amended. You can only do that on the most previous commit though. You can't like, or you, you could, but it would be a really bad idea to go back and change things because if you if you're familiar with like linked lists or trees, you know how like the nodes reference each other. These are just like nodes, and their references are this hash code here. 
And this hash code is generated based on the differences in files, the date, the user. So if you change that, that hash code anywhere in your tree, it's going to break everything up until that point. So you might as well have just, you may have had like a bunch of stuff going on linked up. You go back here and change this, all of a sudden this reference to this node here is broken. And that has, to, we can go into resetting if you want to do that. Um, there's a couple ways to do that. So that's how you would amend a file. And we can also revert to commits using these hash codes. So let's add another commit. Um, let's add something to that file. So we amended some text and we've modified it. We're going to, this is a cool shortcut. If you do dash am, it'll add it and add a memo. So now we have two commits, but maybe we didn't like that commit. We can go backwards by using a revert and using this hash code here. You don't have to select the whole thing, even if you just selected a couple characters. It's likely that the algorithm determines something unique, but you can take any section of that as long as it is unique. Or, oh no, that's not what I wanted. I want to copy. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> Oh, I wasn't using Vagrant. So we can copy any one of these hashes. Say we wanted to go back to that first commit. We can just copy a piece of that. And then that will revert, or could not revert. Oh, okay, yeah, we, we did revert, and we can see the change was that something was deleted. Actually, don't know what happened there. Could not revert. Okay. I don't know what happened there. It's a live demo for you. <laughs> Is there um, anything else you guys want to see specifically? Um, we can do branching. We can get into merging branches, but it's really difficult to do, especially in a live demo. Uh, ignoring files. Oh. And why you would want to do that. Okay. That would be a good one to cover. So, yeah. There may be some things you want to ignore in a, in a project. Specifically, like build directories where you're putting like the compiled code or something in a project or a directory of things like that. 
just anything you want to ignore. It's relatively easy to set up an ignore file. So maybe we have a folder called build that we want to ignore. Now if we if we don't want anything in that folder to get added, like if we if we add something now, we're gonna get bugged about untracked files being in that build folder all the time. And eventually you're gonna end up committing those to the repository if they keep showing up there. So the way to ignore things is by setting up a git ignore file right in the root directory. So we're in the root directory of our project. We're going to create a file with the the name .git ignore. And this is kind of like this will help if you're familiar with Unix syntax because you can just say oh build the slash star and that'll just re it'll um refuse anything in that build directory. Maybe we want to ignore anything ending in the extension of CS, because we don't like C sharp. We touch, uh, we'll add a CS file. And it's, it's still going to, we have to add that and commit to the repository. broke something a minute ago with that revert. Okay. So if we say git status, we notice that the working directory is clean. We still have files that we haven't added to the repository, including the build and thing. Let's see us, and that's because they're being ignored in the git ignore file. So that's one of the benefits of that git ignore. And that's really like it's not very difficult to set up. Um, if you're looking for like project specific things, you can, if you just Google git ignore, there's actually a repository of sample git ignore files. So maybe you're working in a project for. I don't know, grails. This is like what they'll recommend that you ignore. So probably a little more I don't know. So Java get ignore. You wouldn't want any dot class files, obviously, that's like your compiled stuff. Any jars, wars, or years. You know, if you wanted to commit a jar file, you would need to remove that from the git ignore. So that's how you ignore files using git. Um, you can set global git ignores as well. I'm not going to really get into that because it's best to keep them on a project by project basis, but if you really wanted to like never commit a certain kind of file, maybe you have some kind of weird configuration files that you use, you could configure those to work on a user basis instead of a project basis. Um, I'll talk a minute about the different kinds of merges. Um, you may have noticed while doing merges or not that some are considered fast forward. And then, so basically what happens with a fast forward merge, so say you have two trees, right? Or two branches. Say this is your master. This is some kind of new feature. It's considered fast forward if for some reason you branch off and nothing ever gets added here again. He's actually referencing that same head. So the head we looked at earlier, when you create a new branch, until you actually make your first commit, the heads are the same. And then this one, when you commit on that branch, would have a new one. So it actually find, has a way when you merge into, to just merge into one tree using fast forward, which you don't have to worry about conflicts ever because no changes have been made here. 
if there has been a change made, um, it usually will try to do a recursive strategy when merging. And the only time you'll run into conflicts with that really is when two different trees have edited the same branch in the same place. So two people can actually work in the same file without relative issues, but it's when two people make the same change on the same, a different change on the same line, and that's really where conflicts occur. And you can resolve those in the command line, but I would recommend using a source tree or something like that because it makes it really easy to like look at a section and say, I want to use that one or this one. If you want to use command line, it actually has you open up the editor and it'll like have little symbols saying this is this one, this is this one. You have to manually like edit them out and change them. I'm not gonna really not really looking to get into that <laughs> in this uh whole walkthrough. Is there anything else you guys want to see? Can you talk about like with the remote how the whole fork and pull request stuff works? Okay. So yeah, like right here, if we wanted to fork this. Um, so you may look around, and a lot of people just download zip files or clone your desktop using the GitHub app, but you can actually copy this. And then we could say that. And that's going to actually pull down that whole repository, and we can CD into it. And we've got all that source code. So we have all those git ignores now. Um, forking is really just pulling it, copying it to your GitHub account. That's not necessarily just a git thing. It's really just making a pull request. Um, and then, are you, you wanting to know about like pushing? Or? Yeah, so say, say you wanted to work on a project that's on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And you made changes. I just don't understand the process of like, because everything I've done with GitHub, I've, I've changed this and then I can just push to the master branch on mine mm -hmm. and then it just changes it, right? But, but other repositories like this one, for instance, you could just change a file and then push it because then anyone could just like mess it up. Right. So I just don't understand how that all works. I'm not actually familiar with that. I've never worked on like a open source project, I guess, where you have multiple people working on projects like that, where it's like public, other people are pushing and such. Um, I believe that they makes a push request of some kind, and then that kind of merges the two, but honestly, I, I don't know. I've never done it. Um, I've worked with it a bit, and the easiest way to kind of see that everything they're done is um, if there's multiple users doing pushes, um, it goes to the ad administrator of the, the repository, um, and he will check off the, com the commits to make sure that they're functioning with the entire program, and then he will allow the commit to happen. So and then, so then they, the administrator merges. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I've never seen it happen. I'm not really familiar with how that goes about. Like if they attempt to push it or how that works. I'm not sure that's functionality just in Git. I think that might be a GitHub thing, but I'm not sure. Does everyone know how to look like hook things up to GitHub? Or Bitbucket? It's pretty simple. Yeah? Alright, cool. Any other questions? Awesome, guys. Well, thanks for coming out. We're going to have another presentation next week. Uh, Matt Johnson's going to talk about task management next week. If you guys are interested in coming, that'd be cool. And uh, if you hurry, you might be able to get some food still. <laughs> Thanks, guys.